Hello, everyone. I'm Harvey Brownstone, and today's special guest is a legendary actor, athlete, and humanitarian who's best known for playing the invincible Victor Newman for 42 years on the number one daytime drama series of all time, The Young and the Restless. He first came to our attention as Captain Hans Dietrich in The Rat Patrol and as Dr. Charles Forbin in Colossus, The Forbin Project. And who can ever forget him as John Jacob Astor IV in Titanic, or my favorite, Reese Paxton in The Man Who Came Back. In 2017, he published a highly compelling book entitled, I'll Be Damned, How My Young and Restless Life Led Me to America's Number One Daytime Drama. The book chronicles his amazing journey as a youngster in post-war Germany to his struggles as a young actor in Hollywood constantly being typecast in one-dimensional roles, playing Nazi officers and bad guys, and coming to terms with the realization of the devastating crimes against humanity committed by the Nazi regime. This inspirational man has dedicated himself to atoning on behalf of Germany and to finding meaningful ways to advance the relationship between Americans, Germans, and the Jewish community. He's won three Soap Opera Digest Awards, a Daytime Emmy Award, a People's Choice Award, and he has a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. He's been honored in Monte Carlo, Italy, France, Germany, and he received a humanitarian award by the government of Israel. I'm thrilled and delighted to welcome Mr. Eric Braden to our show. Mr. Braden, thank you so much for joining us. Bobby, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. I must tell you that your book moved me so much, not only because of your highly successful acting career, but because of your honesty and sincerity in dealing with some very tough issues in your life, starting with the loss of your father when you were only 12, which planted a kind of inner rage inside you. Was the trauma of losing your dad the defining event of your life? I would say yes. Yeah. Leaves you with a lot of questions makes you want to ask very fundamental questions about life and meaning thereof and religion and philosophy and none of whom can give you good answers. They really can't. It's, that's when I decided to, at an early age, to veer away from religion, uh, found it insufficient in its ability to give me answers about those fundamental questions. And I go back to Shakespeare, you know. Life is but a walking shadow, a poor player that struts and frets his hour upon the stage and then is heard no more. It is a tale told by an idiot, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. Well, I know you were raised to be religious, but you wrote that you had two questions that religion could not answer. How could a loving God allow the cruelties of war? And how could a loving God have taken your father away so young? So, Mr. Braden, have you ever figured out the answers to those questions? No, I have not. And there is no answer to that question. I certainly don't want to dishearten people who believe there is, but there isn't. If there were a loving God, would about 40 to 50 million people have died during the Second World War? If there were a loving God to the Jews, would six million Jews have been killed during that time? Would we have all kinds of war since and before if there were a loving God? It's, it's, I'm sorry. And you cannot give me the bright answer of saying God works in mysterious ways. Well, very mysterious as far as I'm concerned. Okay, I, that question is so fundamental, obviously, to all of us. And now with the new discoveries made by the Webb telescope into the universe is mind boggling. And I am an agnostic, not an atheist, but an agnostic. I don't know. Do I think that there's a possibility that there's some extraordinary unfathomable brain behind all this? Yes, because there's an extraordinary order to nature and to the universe, it's incredible. So there will always be the question, why? That doesn't mean one is less observant of what, in my case, Christianity has taught me, to love all human beings, 
to have a sense of universality, to have a sense of forgiveness, to have a sense of making no discrimination as to what station of life you're from. We are all creatures on this earth together. And if you want to use the term God sort of as an all-encompassing term, I buy that. But if you use it to distinguish between your group of people and some other group of people, then I get very angry because yeah. that is so parochial and so provincial, I can't stand it because a lot of damage has been done in the name, in the name of those narrowed boundaries that certain religions place on us. And that I disagree with completely. Yeah, me too. In 1959, at the age of 18, you came to America with $50 in your pocket. You had a variety of jobs and even went to Montana State University for a while. But by 1961, you had a role in Operation Eichmann. Did you ever think of being an actor as a child? I would lie to you if I said no, but I also cannot categorically say yes. I sort of played with the idea a little bit after seeing certain movies. And, you know, I grew up with, with Clark Gable and, and John Wayne and Jean Gabin, the French actor, uh, the German actor Kurt Jürgens, and, and those were my early images of actors. And obviously when you grow up after the war, especially, in the cold of northern Germany, a lot of windy and foggy nights in the winter, you begin dreaming about being this, being that, being here, being there. And what fascinated me the most was the American West, I must say. So yes and no. I was always very good in school and reading poetry and reading aloud. And I think that was kind of a training for me. I was always good at cold readings when I went to interviews in Hollywood or Broadway. And because we had to do that in German high school, we had to read aloud of German classical texts. And I took a liking to it. I don't know why, no idea. But you worked with Marlon Brando in Maury Turi. He I told you that he studied acting with Lee Strasberg for the sole purpose of picking up women. And he uh, told you that you were too bright to be an actor. What was your reaction? <laughs> I said to him, I said, you of all people should say that. I said, you are the most prodigiously gifted actor known to our generation. I said, you're known the world over. I said, you have enormous influence. I said, I know you read a lot. And what a wonderful profession. And I think Marlon wrestled with fame. I think early fame is a poison, an absolute poison that most people underestimate that applies to athletes, musicians, actors, anyone who becomes famous early on, I would suggest you see a therapist. I'm serious about that because the pitfalls you will encounter with early success are sometimes mind blowing. They really are. And they take the fundament out from under you because you grew up with knowing who you are more or less. And suddenly you're thrust into the limelight, into what is called fame. And what is fame? It's an ephemeral thing. Yet it's very real. The repercussions of it are very real. You suddenly walk into restaurants and they have a chair for you or a table for you. Doors open for you. All kinds of people say hello to you that never would give you the time of day. That's difficult to deal with if you juxtapose that with where you came from. You know, it's, and I think Marlon was so famous and a star of such enormous dimensions that he had difficulty dealing with it. He didn't know what to do with it. The most prodigiously gifted actor of our generation and just full of creativity and, and, and bright. And uh, so I think that the discrepancy between who you know you are and who you have become is too big, is too large of a chasm between those two facts, those two realities. And you need guidance to go through that. Now, in 1961, Mr. Braden, you saw a Swedish documentary called Mein Kampf about Hitler. 
and that it plunged you into a state of rage, shame, and profound confusion. Because as a child in school in Germany, you were not taught anything about Hitler and the Holocaust. So you started writing to your mother to ask for explanations of what happened in the war. How did she respond? You know, she sighed deeply and said she's always been apolitical all her life. And she said, I wish your father were here to talk to you about certain things. And was pretty well left at that. But she said, I remember what one did to the white Jews, meaning the German Jews, one will never forgive us. And I didn't know what she meant by that, really. Where I come from in Northern Germany, there weren't too many Jews. They were mostly around Frankfurt and Berlin and the bigger cities. That is all the discussion I ever had with her because one of my schoolmates came up to me one day on the way home from school to the train station and said, I got to tell you a secret. I said, what? She says, I'm Jewish. I said, oh, I didn't know what to do with that. So I went home to my mother and I said, um, Udo Burg told me that he was Jewish. What does that mean? And that's when she let out that sigh. She says, what one has done to the white Jews, one will never forgive us. And years later, did I understand what she meant by that. And German Jews continued to exercise that prejudice towards Eastern European Jews. In other words, inherent in that statement by my mother was, whatever happened to the Eastern Europeans, didn't concern them because there was an enormous racist attitude towards Eastern Europeans and Russians in particular and Poles, never mind Jews. And that prejudice was shared by German Jews towards Eastern European Jews. Whether Jews like to hear that or not, but that's a fact. I know this from Jewish friends of mine who grew up in New York, who told me that the New York German Jews were the cream of the crop and they look down on anyone else. So no. much for human kindness and so much for the lack of prejudice amongst people. Prejudice is a horrible thing. It sure is. You've spoken very publicly and passionately about the cliched image of Germans and the fact that after the war, many people used the term German and Nazi interchangeably. Yes. You even had a producer say to you early on that if you weren't German, you'd be a big star in this town. Yes. Do you think that the German government did enough in terms of public relations after the war to improve the image of Germans in America so they wouldn't be portrayed as what you referred to in your book as a stern bunch of goose-stepping Nazis? Right. So it, it's, it's a very good question. Let me put it this way. You're talking about a 12-year history, 1933 to 45. You are talking about an evolution in German politics that some people foresaw, but no one foresaw the extent of it at a time when there was no television, at a time when after 1933, after the assumption of power by Hitler, he assumed all power over all newspapers and radio, all of it, without exception. He arrested all those who were opposed to him, never mind Jews but all those who were not Jewish, who were opposed to him. The first concentration camps in Germany were built for Germans who opposed Hitler, socialists, communists, etc., intellectuals, etc. So coming to America with somewhat of an open mind and open eyes, I always thought, I thought, who are you over here to talk about those 12 years exclusively? as if there was no anti-Semitism in America, in Canada, I don't know so much about Canada, but in England, in France, everywhere there was anti-Semitism, but especially also in America. You had quotas at universities in America where only so many Jews could be allowed. This quota existed to the 60s. You had country clubs here in LA that didn't allow Jews. I saw all that living here, you know, from the uh, age of 19 on, onward. And I thought, this hypocrisy is stunning. 
Then I realized you've had over 300 years, nearly 400 years of slavery and utter discrimination against blacks. So who the fuck is anyone in the world to talk only about Germany, a 12 year period in Germany? Having said that, the egregiousness of the affront to humanity committed by the Nazis in Germany is unparalleled, is extraordinary. For that reason, there's almost nothing the German government can do except what it has done. It has obviously many times apologized for the atrocities committed in Germany's name. It has supported Israel since 1949. It has paid reparations. It has acknowledged its sins. Probably the only country in the history of the world that has done that. America still is not doing it towards America's African-Americans. Canada is only recently recognizing what it has done to Native Americans. The Brits get away with it all. You know, let's not talk about colonial history or the colonial history of the French and the Belgians and the Brits and the Span Spaniards and the Portuguese. I mean, line them up. So prejudice is a universal phenomenon. However, as I say, Germany has fully admitted to the degree of its atrocities that were committed in Germany's name. And that still angers me. Now, have Germans done enough as far as PR is concerned? There's no PR. You just admit to what had happened and you try to make up for it. Well, you've worked very hard to help people realize that all Germans were not and are not Nazis and anti-Semites. You were only four years old when the war ended, so you can't be held responsible for anything that the Nazis did. And yet, it's clear that you believe that your generation of Germans had an obligation to atone for the sins of the father, so to speak. Where did that sense of responsibility come from? I think, look, when you grow up, partly during the war and after the war, you're filled with all kinds of anger about so many issues. You know, authoritarian teachers who came back from the war with one arm or one leg or injured who had seen stuff that you and I don't want to imagine. And then seeing that film, Mein Kampf, really that Swedish documentary film about the Nazi era had an enormous influence over me. And then you must remember I played soccer for a Jewish team called the Maccabees from 1963, two or three onward till 1973, when we won the US championship, we won the US Open Cup. And I met a lot of German Jews who had fled Nazi Germany in the late 30s. Some had been in camps, long conversations with some of them, till four or five in the morning sometime, asking them questions. And then I had a coach, Max Wozniak, who was from Cologne, a great goalkeeper, great coach, loved Germany but was expelled from Germany at the age of 12 into Poland, to Russia, came back after the war, went to Israel, came back to Germany, loved Germany. He was more German than I was. And then I read a book that I recommend to you highly. It's called The Pity of It All by Elon Amos, a wonderful book about Jews from 1733 to 1933 in Germany. You've got to read that book. It should be a must read for all Jews, all Americans and Canadians for that matter. It's a wonderful book about the history of the first contact between Jews and Germans and how Jews had arrived at an extraordinarily successful stage in German society, more so than in America, than in England, than in France, than in certainly Russia, far more so. I'm talking about Moses Mendelssohn as the first one who came as a 14 year old boy to Berlin and how Jews during the First World War, German Jews were so patriotic. When you read that, what they said in defense of Germany during the First World War, how they were anti-British, anti-French and hurrah about Germany full-blooded patriots for Germany. 10,000 were decorated 
fighting for Germany in the First World War. When you put all that together and then see this Austrian private, this bastard, come along, and like all right-wingers, like all right-wingers, like all fascists, they need someone as an enemy to build themselves up. And what's an easier enemy than to say the Jews are responsible for everything? Well, the Jews were responsible for Germany's success to 1933. They had a lot to do with it in banking, intellectually, in culture, etc. They were an intricate part of Germany. And to then juxtapose that with what followed makes me so angry. It's extraordinary. The baseness of that intellect, of that piece of shit, Hitler, to look at a whole group of people who had done so much for Germany, to look at a whole group of people living east of the Oder Neisse, all the Eastern Europeans. He called them subhuman. All the Slavs, the Russians, the Poles, to him, they were subhuman. And this little fart from Austria made himself out to be the top of the Aryan race. There's no such thing as bullshit. When you think back on Germany's history, Germany was overrun during the Roman Empire alone by peoples from all over the world. The Romans had Persian legions who were stationed in Germany partly. The Romans occupied Great Britain for hundreds of years, France for hundreds of years, Germany partly for hundreds of years. And he called himself the Aryan race. I mean, it's a joke. I know it's unbelievable. It's it really is unbelievable when you think oh. about it. One of the things that I admire about you so much, Mr. Braden, is that you're a man of action, not just words. Listen to some of the things you've done. For 10 years, you played with the Maccabees, which is a Jewish soccer team. Yeah. You were appointed to the German-American Advisory Board, and you were instrumental in the creation of the German-American Cultural Society, which promotes dialogue about German-American Jewish issues. Yeah. You went to Israel and met with Prime Minister Shimon Peres, and you mm -hmm. also went on the March of the Living to commemorate the Holocaust in Poland. In fact, you were chosen to light the ceremonial fire in front of the crematorium at Auschwitz. Mr. Braden, I want to commend you for the lifelong commitment you've made to Holocaust education and to improving German-Jewish relations. It means a lot to me personally, and I want you to know that. Thank you. In fact, I vividly remember you appearing on Larry King in the late 80s, and you had a fascinating discussion about German-American Jewish relations. And Larry King said publicly, that it was one of the most interesting interviews he had ever done. Do you remember it? I remember it vividly. And I'll tell you what had happened. Larry King was a wonderful man. Larry King had the extraordinary gift to listen. He was the best interviewer I've ever been with. You are close to it now. Oh, thank you. And because he listened. And the reason I said that to him it's because the night before I had been to the Kennedy Center in Washington, D.C. And who is who in American politics were there? All the top senators. The two leading speeches were given by Kissinger and by von Weizsäcker, the then German president. Two wonderfully conciliatory speeches. The German Jew and the president of modern day Germany, who had been a soldier during the war. Very bright man, extraordinarily impressive man. And then they played Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, which is one of the most conciliatory pieces of music, appealing to universal love, humanity, etc. I was very moved, I must say. So the next day I looked at the New York Times and the Washington Post, and then about four lines each. About what? about the performance of the Berlin Philharmonic of Beethoven's Ninth. Not a word about the conciliatory speeches by both Kissinger and von Weizsäcker. That really pissed me off. And so Larry invited me the next day. So it happened I was going to be on a show anyway. And he said, what are you doing here? He was in Washington, D.C. then. And I told him, you know, what had happened. 
He said, really, and that then prompted a long conversation about that issue. Now, before we move on to discuss your acting career, I want to mention how impressed I was by a speech you gave entitled Thoughts on Being German, which yeah. you described as a commentary on the cruelty and potential tragedy of collective condemnation, making snap assumptions about people based on superficial labels without investing the time, energy, and sensitivity to discover who the person really is. You included the speech in your book, and I hope everyone reads it because it really touched my heart. Thank you for writing such a thoughtful and insightful speech. Thank you. Yeah. You know, I wrote it in, I wrote it in about 45 minutes. And I was supposed to give a speech to a group of Germans up in San Francisco, I think. And I thought, what the hell am I going to talk about? And then I sat down in a hotel room. Hotel rooms, strangely enough, in a strange city, are sometimes very good to be creative. And it all just flowed out. It all went on paper within about 45 minutes. That's amazing. That's yeah. just amazing. Now, a lot of people may not know that you were being considered to replace Sean Connery as James Bond, but you yeah. were not British, so you didn't get the part. Would you have liked to have played James Bond? Well, in retrospect now, yes, of course. At that time, no. I'll tell you why. I had just done Colossus, the Foreman Project, the science fiction film at Universal Studios, in which I starred my first starring role in an American picture, for which I changed my name from Hans Gudegast to Eric Brain, because Lou Wasserman, the then head at Universal Studios, said no one with a German name would star in an American picture. Hence my decision, very difficult decision, to change my name. So at that time, film producers never watched television. So Camille Broccoli had no clue prior to seeing Colossus that I had played German parts on the Rap Patrol and combat and what have you. So he was interested in me playing James Bond. So we had lunch and he said, do you still have a British passport? I said, I have a German passport. And it went down like a curtain. He said, oh. So then afterwards, of course, he said, under no circumstances would anyone who is not a member of the British Commonwealth play James Bond. And that was the end of that. But at that time, I wasn't really that interested. I thought, hmm, it's derivative. You know, who is better than Sean Connery? But nowadays, yeah, it would have been interesting for a while. For a yeah. while. <laughs> they don't play the stars all that well, I don't think. Now, way back in 1980, you. you signed a three-month contract to play Victor Newman on The Young and the Restless. Is it true that Dabney Coleman had a hand in selling you on the idea of doing a soap opera? You bet. Dabney and I would play tennis together. He was one of the best tennis players in town and certainly the best celebrity. And we often played together. And we would, as actors do, when they get together, I said, what are you doing now? Da, da, da. I said, you know, I was recently approached uh, to see someone at CBS for a soap. What's a soap? He says, do it, you'll love it. I said, really? He says, oh yeah, you, you, you love it. Huh. That is what prompted me to go to the interview. And that is the beginning of my 42 year career on the show. Well, before The Young and the Restless, you spent at least 10 years playing villains on TV shows, and then you started playing Victor Newman, who was a ruthless, manipulative, sometimes cruel character. Were you surprised, Mr. Braden, that the audience immediately fell in love with you as Victor Newman? I didn't know that then, and I didn't want to stay on the show because I had played too many bad guys. I felt dehumanized. I just didn't want to do it anymore. I told Bill Bell a long meeting and I said, you know, if you could imbue this character with a background that makes him who he is and we all understand why he is who he is, perhaps we can imbue this character with some humanity. And he didn't say anything. And about two months later, I had a scene around Christmas time with Nikki. And she was always curious about my childhood. I never talked about it. And Bill had written this absolutely wonderfully touching 
wonderfully touching scene. Victor finally breaking down and telling her about his childhood that was spent in an orphanage, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Once I did that scene, I walked to my dressing room, I called my wife, I said, I'm staying. Because I instinctively felt now I have something to play. Now I have something to identify with. And the rest is history. Yeah. I'm so glad you did that because by telling the producers that you wanted a backstory, you created a fully fleshed out human being. And you said in the book that some people in the industry used to see soap opera stars as second class citizens. Mm -hmm. I'm surprised by that, Mr. Braden, because everyone knows you film five shows a week. It's the hardest, most intense work in the business. I hope you don't still get that kind of attitude from people in the industry. You know, uh, it's a very good question, Harvey. It is, it is, first of all, I don't give a damn. <laughs> uh, secondly, I've done it all. I've done it all before many of them have done it. And I've worked with the biggest on Broadway and film, television, etc. Done over 100 guest star roles in nighttime television. All those stars are either dead now or they're not working. So the feeling still prevails in our business, I think to a certain degree, people don't realize this is the hardest working medium for an actor there is, period. And I would dare say for a writer, imagine writing for 20, 25 characters every day, year in, year out. And imagine doing between 15, 20, and as many as 62 pages in one day of dialogue for an actor. Just imagine that. I can't. I can't imagine. That's why I'm surprised anybody would say that you're a second-class citizen because... They don't know. They don't know. They clearly don't know. No, they now, of no. course, you know I have to ask you about Titanic. You played John Jacob Astor IV, and you described director James Cameron as a genius. I have to ask you about the scene where your character drowned on the grand staircase. I can't even imagine how terrifying that must have been for you. Why didn't you use a stuntman? The night before, the assistant director came to me and said, you know, James would love you to do the scene, but if you don't want to, we'll use a stuntman. I said, what does it entail? As well, it entails water coming in and then you walk up the stairs and your turn to motivate another guy to release 150 tons of water through the ceiling of the ship. And I said, uh huh. Now, I've been in a lot of action films, action television stories, so I knew how to ask the right questions. I said, Have you rehearsed it? She says, Well, we can't because, you know, it's all computer driven, and we obviously cannot inundate the set with tons of water right now. I said, Okay, tell you what, tell James I'll do it. If we have about three or four run-throughs, dry run-throughs, there are 12 cameras, I think, in the scene. And we did the dry run-throughs. I had yet to understand what all of that scene entailed. So I said, well, it's okay. All right, cool, let's go. So I see all these cameramen in diving suits, you know, and oxygen tanks. And I said, what is going on here? So action. So the water comes in on the sides and begins to rise and rise and rise. What they hadn't reckoned with is how the force of the water would drive chairs and tables and pieces of furniture through the set. So that was an added danger that no one had really reckoned with. So as I'm on the way up the stairs, I thought, oh shit. So now I walk up the stairs and I have to turn. And then suddenly this 150 tons of water come through the top glass ceiling. And I got to tell you, I was scared. I've done a lot of fights in my life, real and not so real, and been used to a lot of stuff. But this scared the hell out of me. And I was glad when they said cut. The water was up to I don't know where. And anyway, we all got out OK. That so, was quite a scene. Yeah. James Cameron is a genius. 
Now, in 2008, you produced and starred in my favorite Eric Braden movie, The Man Who Came Back. You saw that, that was your first big project as a producer. And I just wondered, did you ever want to be a director? Good question. When I did nighttime television, I worked with a lot of directors who said, you know, you should direct as well. And so I'd been approached before. Then I did a 20 minute try their 20 minute film, a revenge thing. And Menachem Golan wanted to produce it and give us money for the, I didn't know that. The producer I worked with at the time lied to me about it and said Menachem Golan was not interested in this and that. Uh, that wasn't true at all as it turned out much later, years later. I've never forgiven that person for it. And I directed those 20 minutes and I got to tell you, I loved it. Loved it from the moment I did the first scene. I thought, hmm, this feels good. So then when this came around, the man who came back, I was involved in the casting and some of the producing and enjoyed that enormously. I brought George Kennedy, Sean Young, Armin Asante, Billy Zane, Peter Jason, James Patrick Stewart. I got all those people to come down to Texas and do something about the latter part of the 19th century during Reconstruction, after the Civil War had ended and supposedly freed the slaves. And it was about a strike in Thibodeauville, Louisiana, the 1870s. A strike where black workers on plantations and black workers on the railroad struck for a dollar a day they wanted to be paid in real money, a dollar a day. They didn't want to be paid in scrip, which was the money that they were given on plantations that could only be exchanged for goods on the plantation. That first strike in Thibodeauville was ruthlessly cut down by militias from Shreveport, Lafayette, and New Orleans, where the plantation owners got together and said, we got to stop this shit. And they cut down the strikers with the first Gatlin machine guns. And once I knew about that, I said, that's what I want to do. I want to do this in obviously microcosm. We didn't have the money. I wish we had had the money to really do it big time, but we didn't. But it was part of the American history that interested me. And the knowledge of that was not known to many people, it was part of America's hypocrisy in regard to slavery. That's what I wanted to do. At the greatest time in the film, I think I ever had on any film, that working with all those actors, wonderful actors, George Kennedy, Billy Zane, Ahmed Asandi, James Patrick Stewart, Peter Jason, Sean Young, they're wonderful. Yeah, it was a wonderful movie. I want to quote you something, Mr. Braden, that you wrote in your book about the Hollywood lifestyle. You said, I loathe Hollywood parties. There's something repulsive to me about groups of overdressed people gathering to posture and name drop and blow smoke up each other's asses, trying to impress each other, lying about non-existent projects they're involved in, all in an effort to get a job or cozy up to a successful party guest they might be able to use. So I have to ask you, how have you managed to remain so unpretentious and so down to earth all these years? Sports. Sports, really. You know, I never got sucked into that maelstrom because how my soccer team did was more important to me. How the soccer team of my son did, who I coached for 25 years, was more important. Doing well in the ghetto gym, 78th and Hoover in LA, boxing with blacks was more important to me. Playing tennis was more important to me. My family life was more important to me. I don't give a shit about those Hollywood parties. I couldn't care less. Never have, never will. It's meaningless. I love that about you. And, and when I think of the remarkable life you've lived, I want you to just sit back and listen to some of these highlights from your life. You were friends with everyone from Fernando Lamas to Esther Williams to Jesse Ventura and Wayne Newton. You played tennis with Prince Albert of Monaco. You flew cross country with Muhammad Ali. 
You've met President Reagan, the president of Tunisia, the prime minister of Italy and the prime minister of Turkey and prime minister Shimon Peres of Israel. You got to introduce Soviet secretary general Mikhail Gorbachev when he spoke at the Phoenix Club. You were twice presented with the German Federal Medal of Honor and the State of Israel presented you with a humanitarian award. And you're the first German born actor since Marlene Dietrich to receive a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. For your 25th anniversary on The Young and the Restless, the mayor of Los Angeles proclaimed it Eric Braden Day in LA. Do you ever have to pinch yourself to realize the incredible life you've had? Now that you bring it all up, yeah, you know, <laughs> and and I, you know, my God, what a life! What you a know. life! And what 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 extraordinary people I've met. One of the most impressive was Gorbachev, and uh, one of the other most impressive was Shimon Peres, very impressive human being. Well, I know you're a very busy man. I have only one more question for you. Huh? When you were 12 years old, you promised your father that you would make him proud. Mm -hmm. Looking not only at your professional achievements, but especially at the way you've lived your life as a husband and a father and a humanitarian and athlete, I hope you can see that you have, in fact, not only made your father proud, you made everybody proud of you, Mr. Braden. Well, that is very kind of you to say, Harvey. And it's, it's, I truly am not someone who rests on my laurels. I always see a new challenge, you know? And now I got to do a boxing scene on y and I'm going to hit the heavy bag. And I love doing that in real life as well. I don't spar anymore, but I still calm down after hitting the heavy bag or lifting a lot of weights. Sports has always been, been my saving grace, really. My early interests, Growing up for sports and girls. <laughs> well, Mr. Braden, it's been an enormous pleasure and an honor meeting you and having this opportunity to celebrate your remarkable life and your career. I'm a huge fan of your work. I'm an even bigger fan of you as a person. I know there are a lot of demands on your time. Your shooting schedule is very demanding. I want to thank you so much for taking the time to come on our show. I really, really appreciate it. Harvey, I must say that I appreciate the interview. You're very good, you're very sensitive, you're very insightful, and you ask damn good questions. And you obviously have done your homework. I really appreciate it, all right? And say hello to your fellow Canadians. I've always loved coming up there, I still do. And hopefully soon again, all right? You are welcome here anytime, sir. Our guest has been the one and only Eric Braden. My name is Harvey Brownstone. Thank you to our producer, Steve Silver. Thank you all for joining us. See you next time. Thanks for watching. Be sure to check out all the great interviews on the Harvey Brownstone Interviews YouTube channel. Don't forget to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified when new videos are posted.